times. One that has affected every woman you know, including you, if you are a woman. Today's guest knows about this cultural shift because she was a part of it. She also was an unwitting pawn in a coup that was far deeper and more pervasive than she realized. Today, she's going to tell her story and how she helped to subvert the women's movement. She'll also reveal the dirty secrets that were part of it, the internal and external influences that affected it, the carefully constructed plan and strategies that executed it, and the players who, like herself, wittingly or unwittingly, made it happen. It is an insightful, informative, and somewhat startling tale she will tell. Now a disclaimer. This is going to be an eye-opening discussion and a frank one as well, so it may not be suitable for young viewers. Stay with us. the University of Missouri School of Journalism to be an investigative reporter, but unwittingly ended up becoming a propagandist for sexual liberation instead. Though she did not realize until much later that a carefully constructed ideology meant to become ubiquitous in the culture was influencing her thinking and her personal choices, she nonetheless became complicit in bringing about one of the most dramatic cultural shifts in contemporary times through her position as a staff writer for Cosmo magazine. There she wrote pieces intended to soft sell unmarried sex, contraception, and abortion as the single woman's path to personal fulfillment. Her book, Subverted, How I Helped the Sexual Revolution Hijack the Women's Movement, sets the record straight and gives her honest self-reflection about this time in her life. Let's welcome our guest today, Sue Ellen Browder. Sue Ellen, welcome to Women of Grace. Thank you so much. It's a joy to be here. Well, thank you. And it's, and it's a delight to have you here, too, because I think that you have a perspective from which we can grow and understand how it is that we've ended up, at least partially, where we are today. And, uh, you know, I, I know that, that this has been a, I would imagine, at least, a difficult book to write because it well, it required deep introspection. It was difficult to write. In fact, I was going to write a book about the history of the women's movement and the sexual revolution, and I wasn't going to tell my story. Ah, so what and, caused the change of heart? Uh, it was called The Publisher. <laughs> <laughs> I sent this book, I worked on it for three years before I sold it to Ignatius, and I sent it, when I finished it, I sent it to them, they, they liked it, they said they were going to publish it, and I worked another year on it, they said they wanted my personal story, I had to go back. Oh and my put goodness. my so you'll see that there are two stories in this book. Yes, there's one that's my personal story from Cosmo to Catholic. Yes, and then there's this other the the background of the women's movement, the sexual revolution, and how they got joined together behind well, the scenes. You know, as a writer myself, I of course I noticed that, and I and yeah. I no, yeah. noticed the careful weaving mm -hmm. that took place within your book. And uh, from a, from an author to author, I really admired the 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 craft and the, the ability to do that because it was not jarring in the least bit. I mean, the book, friends, I just have to tell you, it's available through EWTNRC.com. I really, really, really want to encourage you to get this book because it's an honest expose of one person's life and how it was impacted by the cultural shift that was taking place and how she got caught up in it. It reads like a novel, but it is yes. chock full of all kinds of facts and figures. And you're going to see amazing, uh, you know, um, relationships and and, uh, you know, just, just a, a complex strategy that was carefully executed, simple yes. in some ways, and yet executed with such a type of, um, what's the word that I'm looking for? Um, you know, just such a, a subtlety. 
uh -huh. that nobody realized it was happening. They didn't. They didn't. I when I, okay, I went to the University of Missouri School of mm -hmm. Journalism, and I was a, I, I learned how to be a good reporter. Yes. And then I went to New York City. I'd grown up in a small town in Iowa. Mm -hmm. I was very glamour struck. I thought all the beautiful <laughs> magazines. I wanted to be like that. I wanted to be rich. I wanted to be successful. I wanted to be famous. All of those things that you want when you're mm -hmm. 20. And I went to New York City and got a job at Cosmopolitan. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I noticed at that time that's been forgotten, this, we've forgotten our history, and the, and the thing that I noticed at that time was that the women's movement and the sexual revolution were two radically different movements. And I think that is so important. That is the key that started this. I, I wanted to know how did they get joined together? Yes. How did we get to the point where so many young women today to think that to be free is to go to college, get a great degree, have a fantastic job, and be as sexually free as possible. How did those two get joined together? Yeah, and, and we're going to be talking about that. But, uh, you know, I want to ask you, can you give us some dates now? Like, so when did you graduate university? Okay. When did you get to D.C.? When did all of this stuff begin to be the, you know, the, the, the breath that we were breathing as a culture? Right, culture? right. Well, it started, I went, graduated in 1968, and I got a job at Cosmo. I, okay, let's, let's talk about in 1968. 1969, I got pregnant. I, I was married in 67. In 69, I got pregnant. I was fired for being pregnant in those days. Yeah. You were, people don't remember that. They're shocked. You were fired for being, it was <laughs> normal. It was, it was business as usual. Well, you know, I'm going to tell you a little bit of my history, which uh -huh. I'm not going to go into depth about, uh -huh. but, you know, I graduated high school in 1968. Okay. So I remember those years. Uh -huh. I didn't remember that. I did remember other things, but I did not remember that you got fired or you had to leave immediately if right. you were pregnant, or as soon as people began to know you were pregnant because women right. didn't talk about it. Right, right. And, and I was, you had to leave, I w was on a newspaper and you had to leave at age, f at five months pregnant, mm -hmm. but I lied about it. Mm -hmm. And I was eight months pregnant and I was waddling around <laughs> like an elephant with all my, and, and everybody knew I'd lied. And all the men on, on the uh, newspaper were going, you're going to have an elephant. You're going to have an elephant. Yeah, yeah, and they knew. Yeah, yeah. And in eight months, five months, no, no comparison. So, so I went to uh, Cosmo in in the early in 1970. We went to move to New York mm -hmm. City. I got a job in 1971, but it was in 1970 that that the uh, Women's March for Equality was going on. Mm -hmm. There was lots of action in New York City, both the feminist movement and the sexual revolution. Yeah. But you have to remember, Betty Friedan, who started the women's movement to, to correct all these inequalities for women in the workforce and in academia. Women couldn't get a degree in, in they couldn't go to med schools in a lot of cases. They couldn't uh, get uh, credit in their own name mm -hmm. if they were married. Uh, there were lots of injustices that women were upset about, but the, the sexual revolution, which was started, it was not started by Cosmo, but it was participated in by Cosmo. Mm -hmm. uh, the sexual revolution was radically different, and Betty Friedan called Cosmo quite obscene and quite horrible, and even called for a boycott of the magazine at the Women's March for Equality. Well, in a certain way, I mean, Betty Friedan was sort of a, more of a contemporary illustration of the early women's movement, yes. for the suffragettes, yes. who were all about motherhood. You yes. know, they, 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 they vilified abortion. Yes. You know, that, that was not part of where things began, but it was this wedding of the two that caused them to happen. That's and Cosmo, right. however, was really a voice for the sexual revolution, totally. really encouraging women to, uh, you know, to live in ways that, that were so anti-woman. Right, right. To sleep with your boyfriend, uh, to, to uh, we were pushing abortion, contraception, all of these things that if you didn't if you didn't like the man that you were married to, divorce him and go out have an affair with somebody else. All of this stuff was was what Helen Gurley Brown, who had uh, she had transformed Cosmo. Cosmo had originally been a homemaker magazine. Mm -hmm. And uh, he Helen Gurley Brown transformed it into a sex rag. I mean, yeah, that's well, really that's what, what it was. It was yeah. And by the time I got there, but it was very subtle in those days, very much more subtle than it is today. So people say, okay, how did you participate? How did you hijack the women's movement? Well, let me just tell okay. you, my next question was, how, how does a girl from Iowa end up in this situation? Well, I had, and, a, good, you know? I had a good degree. <laughs> <laughs> I, no, I but had, this was not your upbringing. No, no, but I wanted 
to uh, be successful, and this was one. Of, this was the hottest women's magazine in the nation. Uh -huh. And I didn't realize what was going on behind the scenes until I got there. Yeah. And what we were doing was we were making up those stories. Those women that were hopping into bed with men on the first dates and all those things. Those women were not real. Mm -hmm. We made them all up. And the but but going back to how did. How did I help hijack the women's yeah, movement? Yeah, how did you okay. do that? Yeah, Sue how Daughter? did I do that? I said you have to understand how propaganda works. Mm -hmm. and Let's, this is important. This, you know, this is a very important lesson. I hope yes, you have something is. to jot some notes down on. Go ahead. Yes, because we we live in a we swim in a sea of propaganda. That's all this is. Yes, that's all it is. Okay, so how does propaganda work? Well, propaganda doesn't work. It's not outright lies because mm -hmm. then you could spot it. Propaganda is half truth selected truth and truth out of context. And so what happens is with Cosmo when I was there a lot of things were true. Mm -hmm. I wrote articles on how to buy a used car. No problem. But the things that were not true were the, the parts about the sexual revolution, all these women having these big exciting lives when they were hopping to, into bed with all these men. That was the, that was the part that was not true. We do, couldn't find those women in those days. The women were still getting married, having children. You couldn't find those women. Now, ten years later, you could because we created a fantasy world that later women began to actually live. Mm -hmm. they, it, we, once, one, it, was, they, it was a bunch of sex fantasies was what it was. Yes. And women were enjoying the... the the excitement well, of the sex fantasy. It was a vicarious fantasy. experience. Exactly, but it was a sex fantasy, and it was not a real world. And when you got out there in the real world, oh, guess what? You got STDs. You got depressed when you got an abortion. Uh, the guy would leave you. He well, he'd have sex with you one night, and then they were, he was gone. Your relationships were shot. All sorts of things happened in the real world right. that did not happen in that fantasy you know, world we I created. Ha I have to say something, you know, Sue Ellen, I mean, because what you're describing that was, you know, so avant-garde at that time and, and was so counter-cultural mm -hmm. has it become was. the culture. It has. And so, but the women are still being duped because, I mean, I can't tell you the numbers of young women who are doing exactly what I Cosmo has, has formed them and taught them to do and end up with the same results that the women, you know, back in the 60s and 70s ended up with. Right. And they're astonished by this. I know because they're so young and they don't, and they're just swimming in the sea of propaganda and yeah. they don't know. So anyway, how does propaganda work? So that back to half truth, selected truth, yes. and truth out of context. And we're going to leave it there and go to a break and come back and pick up there. Now listen, that's important to write down. So as we go to this break, you know, I want you to keep listening because important information is coming to you right here on EWTN television. But I want you to grab something. Write those down. Half truth, selected truth, and truth out of context. It doesn't change. We're going to be right back with our guest today, Sue Ellen Browder, she's author of the book, Subverted, How I Helped the Sexual Re Revolution Hijack the Women's Movement. It's available for you out there at EWTNRC.com. I'm going to tell you something. You need this book. If you're a mom, you have teenage girls, you need this book. If you're a mom and have little wee girls, you need this book. If you're a mom and you have grown daughters, you need this book and you need to read it. Because I'll tell you what, it's application, this business about propaganda, mm -hmm. all that, that doesn't change. Doesn't that change. part is the same. And we need to take, you know, the blinders off of our eyes and begin to look at reality as it truly is. Available for you at EWTNRC.com. When we come back, I'm going to give you some numbers because we're going to take your calls today. Stay with us. Okay. Okay. Dr. Ray Garendi. I was raised in an Italian Catholic home. We went to church. That's what you did. And now that I'm older, I can't thank my parents enough for allowing me to know about our Lord. Because ultimately, the base that they gave me kept pulling me back to the Catholic Church, even though I wandered as a young adult. The Doctor is in with Ray Garendi. Weekdays, 1 p.m. Eastern on EWTN Radio. Join the pro-life generation as they show their love for the unborn. EWTN takes you to San Francisco for the Walk for Life West Coast. Coverage begins Saturday, January 21st at 2.30 p.m. Eastern on EWTN. 
This is Life Issues with Brad Mattis, president of Life Issues Institute. It's painfully obvious pro-abortion House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi didn't make a New Year's resolution to refrain from highly ignorant comments. Obamacare's bloated government bureaucracy made premiums surge while dropping coverage for millions, and it's forced companies and organizations to fund drugs that cause abortion. It's been such a colossal failure, there's overwhelming support to repeal it. However, Ms. Pelosi responded to Republican efforts to repeal Obamacare by issuing this warning. You break it, you own it, she said. I'd like to remind her Obamacare passed with zero Republican votes, and it's the Democrats who own this albatross. Republicans and Democrats who vote for repeal will be considered our nation's heroes. Follow us on Twitter at Life Issues USA and stay informed, more informed than you've ever been. This is Bishop Paul Bradley of the Diocese of Kalamazoo, Michigan. Hi, this is Tim Staples from Catholic Answers Live. This is Father John Ricardo. Thanks for listening to the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Welcome back, friends. We're visiting with our guest today. I was just telling her she's a brave woman. She says we're all brave women. We need a lot of brave ladies today. This is her book. Her name is Sue Ellen Browder, and the book is Subverted, How I Helped the Sexual Revolution Hijack the Women's Movement. It's available for you out there at EWTNRC.com. I was telling you prior to the break, you just have to get a copy. Uh, First of all, it's a fascinating read, but what you learn and what we can apply to our everyday lives right now, very, very important. It helps to explain so many things. We're gonna continue with our conversation in just a moment, but I do wanna remind you that we are live today. We're taking your phone calls. I'm eager to hear from you. Your insights, comments, inspirations, all that good stuff, we are eager to hear. 800-221-9460 is the number to use if you're here in North America. That's 800-221-9460. If you're outside of North America, your number is country code 1-205-271-2980. If you're in North America, you can use that number too. It's country code 1-205-271-2980. If you are with us via radio today, please note these are not the numbers that we normally give. So you're going to want to make a little note and pay a little closer attention. do want to invite you to get out to our website, womenofgrace.com. And when you get there, I want to invite you to become a subscriber to Women of Grace exclusive. Now, as you know, we always have a patron saint, and our patron saint for our live show today and for the subsequent programs that we're going to be working on after we leave you, uh, we have a great patron saint. She was a radical who spent 15 days in jail for fighting for feminist causes, had a string of failed marriages, an abortion, and even a suicide attempt. But her deep and abiding love for the poor would one day set her on a path to sainthood, and she is a saint in the making. Dorothy Day was born in Brooklyn, New York on November 8, 1897 the third child of Grace and John Day. She was baptized in the Episcopal Church but raised in a nominally religious home. Her interest in radical social causes as a way to help workers and the poor began during her college years. She eventually left school and moved to New York City, where she became involved with socialist publications and protest movements. In 1917, she was arrested for picketing at the White House on behalf of women's suffrage and spent 15 days in jail where she spent 10 of those days on a hunger strike. Even while hobnobbing with communist and socialist activists, she couldn't help but admire the Catholic Church, which she referred to as the Church of the Poor. When her daughter Tamar was born in 1926, she had the child baptized in the church and decided to embrace the faith herself. This meant, of course, the end of her common law marriage and also the loss of many radical friends. Finding it difficult to adjust to Catholicism, she prayed at the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception for some way to help for her to help the poor and unemployed. The very next day, she met a French immigrant and a former Christian brother named Peter Morin, who envisioned a society constructed on gospel values. That vision eventually became the Catholic Worker Movement, which began as a newspaper, but quickly grew into a movement of houses of hospitality and farming communes that spread across the country 
and overseas. She spent the rest of her life trying to live as an authentic Christian, enduring both the hardships of being shot at while working for integration and the honor of addressing the 1976 Eucharistic Congress in Philadelphia. Dorothy Day died at one of her houses of hospitality in New York City on November 29, 1980. Her cause for canonization is ongoing. And Dorothy Day, saying in the making, we do ask for your intercession as we face the challenges of our contemporary society. Amen. She's a great, great model, I think, she in so is. many ways, because she wasn't at all perfect, but right. she strove for perfection. Right. She's very yeah. admirable. And she's very significant that she was a feminist. Yes, she was. Yes, 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 indeed. And, you know, of course, in those days, that meant something completely different than now. And right. you were you were sharing with us how all of this did get hijacked, and you were teaching us about propaganda. Right. And I want you to continue with your lesson, Sue Ellen, right. because this is important for us to know. It doesn't change. It's, yes, and it's very subtle. Yes. It's, so propaganda, there was a man named Edward Bernays, and he was a nephew of Sigmund Freud, and he wrote a book in the 1920s on how propaganda works. How do you sell pianos to people? Well, a piano, especially to the middle class, is a pretty high-ticket item. Yes. So what you do, and he explained, is you sell the music room. And once you have all these beautiful, music, beautiful homes and house, garden, house and gardens and architectural digest, and these people have music rooms, once the middle class is sold on a music room, the next thing they say is, ah, I gotta have a piano. <laughs> exactly. So they think of it themselves. Well, with Cosmo, how do you sell beautiful clothes, makeup, hair, supplies, all of this stuff, trips, fat, trips around the world? How do you sell all of this stuff, um, or abortions, contraception? You sell the Cosmo girl lifestyle. Mm -hmm. if, a, if a girl begins to think, ah, I wanna live like this, she's just gonna, naturally gonna have to have all that other stuff. Yes. So Cosmopolitan, and almost every women's magazine I've seen today, especially the glamour magazines, are selling a lifestyle that will require you to buy a lot of stuff mm -hmm. to keep it going. So it was a commodities thing. Mm -hmm. and, and everything in Cosmo was geared towards selling something. Yes. And in this case, we were selling the Cosmo lifestyle. You think this is fun? Well, let's see then. It will be. But it wasn't, of course. It's a lie. Mm -hmm. It's a lie. But it's, yeah. it's designed to sell commodities. You know, I want to ask you a question. I, and, and, you know, you, you mentioned Helen Gurley Brown. And, of course, mm -hmm. she's the one that caused this transformation to happen right. with a magazine that was originally designed for homemakers, right? Right. And, and she, she was very big on the concept of sex in the single girl, right. which ultimately became a smash television show, Sex in the City, right? right. Based right. on is... this lifestyle, selling that lifestyle in yet right. another format and another media. That's right. But she herself was a troubled soul. Very much so. Uh, in some ways, and she, she was very, um, she had grown up very poor. Mm -hmm. She wanted to be rich and famous. She, she achieved that. Uh, she worked till midnight every mm -hmm. night. Uh, she, she had no children. Um, but also when she was 72, she told Psychology Today that even though she had all of these things, she even had a beautiful marriage. Well, I don't know how beautiful it was, but she had a marriage that it was lasted long 50, standing. Yeah, 50, 50 years. years. Right. So, but she said that even after all of this, she didn't know how to be happy. And she said, I, it's no fun to wake up scared every morning. Mm. And now, what was she scared of? She was scared of losing her magazine, her fame, her beauty which she already, were, once you get to be about 72, I'm 71, <laughs> you, you begin to lose it, guys. <laughs> it just happens. <laughs> and and uh, so all of those things that she thought if she just had enough, she she wrote a book called Having It All. She was she was uh, the having it all lady, you yeah. know. Um, but, she, but it's not about having it all. Right. It's about what you well, how you are inside. It's about right. being. Right. It's about being a child of God. Mm -hmm. And and Helen never was that. She never found it. At least as far as I know, we don't know because of the one the last thing she did in her life was she donated a million dollars to a Catholic boys' school yes. in the Bronx. Yes. So we don't know 
what did happen to Helen inside? Maybe she did find peace. I don't know. Yeah. But she had no peace on when I knew her. No, no, obviously not. She was a driven woman. Yes, she was. And uh, she was. But she was driven by her own demons, too, because there's more to her story that you have to read the book to find right, out about, right, right? right? But the fact of the matter is, uh, even she herself knew that what she was selling was not truth. Oh, sure she did. She was a co she was a copywriter. She was an advertising copywriter. That's what was was her. Um, that's how she became rich and famous yeah, at first. Yeah. And so all of this stuff in Cosmo was twisted to be advertising copy disguised as truth. Yeah. And she she had no uh, concern about uh, lying to make to make it work. So now we have Sue Ellen, and she enters Cosmo, mm -hmm. and you begin to pour out using your craft all of this dribble. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And what was happening to you yeah. in the midst of well, it Well, what was happening to me inside, what was happening to me inside was I was a very troubled soul, mm -hmm. a lot of anxiety. I was married and I had a child. I was not living this Cosmo lifestyle and I didn't believe in this Cosmo lifestyle. But I was, I was writing this stuff to be, because it, that's how you became successful, I thought, in New York. Mm -hmm. And I had also gone to, worked at a newspaper where people were making up things. Mm -hmm. And so it, I figured once I got out in the real world, I'm like, oh, I guess this is the way the real world, world works, you know. Everybody's making this stuff up. And also, I lied to myself, of course, mm -hmm. and said, you know, this isn't going to hurt anybody. Nobody's going to really believe this stuff. Oh, and then when I became Catholic at age 57 and looked back on it and saw how much it had hurt everybody, even men and children, I mean, mm -hmm. we've got all these abortions, all of this stuff, well, then I had to come clean and write this book. Yeah. I had to tell what had happened because I knew that the sexual revolution had been based on lies. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I want for us to, I'm going to give the numbers again, but, uh, but then I want to come back and I want to talk about, uh, you know, this, this furtherance of the propaganda and how it is that um, whenever there's going to be a cultural shift, these factors have to come into play. Right. It doesn't happen on its own. No. There, are, there, no. there are, generally speaking, architects of that yes. cultural shift, yes. and there were. Let me give you these numbers again, 800-221-9460. That's if you're in North America, 9460. If you are outside of North America, or you just want to use this number and you can, it's country code 1-205-271-9460. 2980. Again, country code 1 205 271 2980. Well, we've got about two minutes before we go to a hard break, okay. and we'll have to zip out really fast, but we can begin to tell. Talk with us about the architecture, uh, the architects of this. Okay. Okay. Name names. Okay, all right. Well, Betty Friedan had started the women's movement right. in the 1960 with her book, The Feminine Mystique, and a lot of women were concerned about those things, like being fired for being pregnant, so a lot of women were aboard on that. Yes. What we didn't know was that behind the scenes, there was a man named Larry Lader, mm -hmm. L-A-D-E-R, mm -hmm. who had started the National Abortion well, it was, now it became the National Abortion Rights Action League, and now it's NARAL Pro-Choice America. These things shift. Propaganda machines shift their names as the times change. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to make abortion legal. And he convinced Betty Friedan to insert abortion into the women's movement yeah. as, a, as, as one of our women's rights. Mm -hmm. And he was tied up with a name that many of you right. might know, Dr. Bernard Nathanson. Right, right. Who, who, who later became uh, Catholic and pro-life. Yes. But it, he was, he would, said, Dr. Nathanson said he was responsible for 70,000 abortions. Yeah, we're going to have to leave it right there. Friends, we're going to go to a hard break. When we come back, more with our guest today, Sue. Ellen Browder, I hope that you're finding this discussion not only fascinating, but troubling. Because if you're finding it troubling, then we can do something about it. Certainly do want to recommend that you get out to EWTNRC.com to order a copy of Sue Ellen's book, Subverted, How I Helped the Sexual Revolution Hijack the Women's Movement. We'll be back. designed to help you discover your dignity and vocation as a daughter of God. Join with others at home or church for a journey of discovery and transformation as you explore the call and gift of your femininity. How about leading a group? 
Everything you need is in the facilitator kit. For information how you can start a group or join one, call 800-558-5452 or visit womenofgrace.com. Get started today on the journey of your life. No Catholic radio station in your area? Perhaps God is calling you to get involved. Learn more about starting a Catholic radio station where you live. Contact Jack Williams, 205-795-5756 or jwilliams at ewtn.com today. January 20th, Feast of St. Sebastian, Martyr. St. Ambrose said this about martyrdom. If there are many persecutions, there are many testings. Where there are many crowns of victory, there are many trials of strength. It is then to your advantage if there are many persecutors. Among many persecutions, you may more easily find a path to victory. Let us reflect. What path to victory have you found in past persecutions? How does this help you seek the path to victory in your current trial? If you'd like to receive a daily Grace Line by email, go to womenofgrace.com and click on the word Grace Line and then check the box Receive Grace Lines. That's womenofgrace.com. This is Bishop William Medley of the Diocese of Owensboro. This is Al Cresta, host of Cresta in the Afternoon. Hi, I'm Archbishop William Laurie, the Archbishop of Baltimore, and you're listening to EWTN Radio. Welcome back, friends. We're visiting with our guest today, Sue Ellen Browder, and she is revealing to us some amazing things, all contained for you in her book, which is available for you out there at EWTNRC.com. As you know, that is the website for EWTN's religious catalog. So we certainly do invite you to get out there to EWTNRC.com. You can call, too. There's a number up there, but it's totally different from the numbers that you use to call us and join us here live on this special simulcast of Women of Grace live today, 800-221-9460. If you're in North America, it's 800-221-9460. If you're outside of North America and you want to join us here today, that number is country code 1-205-271-2980. Again, 1-205-271-2980. Eighty. Now, so Ellen was telling us as we went to our break that indeed, uh, you know, we uh, were were uh, hoodwinked because there was a serious coup that was taking place. That this was a well strategized plan to wed together the women's movement, which was really about equality, right, right. with the sexual revolution, which the women in the women's movement. Now, in the 60s, NOW, National Organization, yeah. at that time, late 60s, early 70s, they, 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 they didn't buy into the no, sexual revolution. No, it was, it was off the radar. Yeah. They, they, they were concerned about academic uh, freedom yeah. uh, and going to law school, medical school, stuff like that, equal, equal pay for equal work. Yeah, and yeah. Women could have a credit card. Right, exactly, in their names. These were not controversial issues, and that's no. why we, we won so many of these things. But abortion, now Larry Later was the founder, as I say, of the National Abortion Rights Action League, which was originally the National Association to Repeal Abortion Laws. Right. Because there, abortion laws were still on the books in, in a lot of states, in most states. Yes. And he wanted to repeal them all. And so he told Bernard Nathanson, who, was, who helped him form that organization, that they needed to recruit the feminists if they wanted their abortion cause to work. Mm -hmm. And, Betty, and the, he knew Betty Friedan personally. Larry Later had been Margaret Sanger's biographer. Mm. So he was a fierce sexual revolutionary. He said that if we, if we tampered with abortion, you could bring all of the sexual morality of the middle class down. And guess what happened? He did. He did it. So he tampered with abortion. So Betty was not convinced that abortion was a woman's right. But later, finally, after this conversation where he said we have to recruit the feminists, he t somehow, in the next six weeks, he convinced Betty that they had to insert abortion as a woman's right into the women's movement. 
And the night that happened was November, we, we've got the exact date, it took me a long time to find this, it was November 18th, 1967, in the Chinese room of the Mayflower Hotel in Washington, D.C. There were only about 100 people in the room that night, and only, and the or abortion right created an uproar. Mm -hmm. all, all these other rights, everybody were 100%, everybody was 100% on women's equal rights to equal work, pay, sure. all of that. Why not? Yes. But when it came to the Equal Rights Amendment, they fought over that, yeah. and the other thing that they and why did they fight over that? Because one woman who walked out, who was a big civil rights leader, said that when human rights are indivisible, now let's think about that. If we see human rights as indivisible, we got a problem with abortion, don't we? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. We've got a problem with a lot of things. The other fight thing that they fought over was abortion that night, and they fought till almost midnight. And only 57 people in that room that night voted to insert abortion into the women's movement, and that is the only right in the women's movement we are still fighting over today. Wow, isn't that incredible? Well, you know, of course, and, and we know how that worked with regard to the indivisible rights. They just declared, and this was a big issue that night too. They uh -huh. they just declared that a fetus was a non-person. Well, they took away personhood. They did, although they didn't say that. When, no, 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 no. Yes, when, yes, yes. But right. when life begins, that that became the issue. That became the issue. Yeah, yes. absolutely. Yes. Well, we do have a caller here with us okay. today, Sue Ellen. Okay. Rosemary is with us from New Jersey. Good morning, Rosemary. How are you, dear? Fine, Jonette. Thank you for all that you do. I think you're just wonderful. Oh, our Lord is good. You are always so interesting. Thank you. And what's your question or comment, Rosemary, for well, our guest? I, I, I have, uh, I'm 72 years old, so I relate a lot to what, all of you, what both of you are saying. But here's my question, is that when my daughter was a child, she had a doll, and this was her favorite doll. She was loved much. I mean, she lost her hair because she was loved so much. And I have a granddaughter who's now in college. She had dolls that were on shelves. But I don't ever recall her playing with a doll like it was her baby. And when I hear my granddaughter talk, and this is upsetting to me, I'm sorry, but she talks about her career and how well she's doing with her sports, but I've never heard her speak about becoming a mom, a wife. And, I mean, I'm married 51 years, so, I mean, obviously it's very important to me. And I would like for you to address that issue and also perhaps give me some ideas. I mean, I have a very close relationship with my granddaughter. She has some idea of how I feel, but perhaps there's some ideas that you can offer. And thank you for all that you do. Oh, well, thank you, Rosemary, for your call today. And, and I think, you know, we were talking about the way in which Cosmo was able to begin to change uh, mm -hmm. the, 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 the desires, you know, and, right. and the future plans of young women. Right. And this is what Rosemary is referring to. Her daughter played with her baby dolls, made connection with them, a relationship right. with them, the maternal instinct developing right. and encouraged through that, you know, kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, use of a baby doll to, to invite right. that to take right. place. Her other, her granddaughter, this woman's child, just keeps the dolls on the shelf and all she talks about is career sports so, you know so w that is exactly what cosmo was trying to that, sell that is because cosmo set, taught you that sex without the kids and hard work will set you free yeah so without the kids was very important Right. That, because you couldn't be free without the kids. And now these kids are getting it in, in schools. This, this, again, we're swimming in this sea of propaganda. Remember, too, there used to be large families, so girls began to take care of the younger siblings in the family. As our families got smaller and smaller and smaller, it wasn't just the loss of baby dolls. It was the loss of babies. Period. Period. Right. You know, I do have a suggestion for Rosemary. Yeah. Rosemary, here's my suggestion. My suggestion is Sue Ellen Browder's book. Your young lady there, she's of college age, she yes. can certainly consume this material. And yes. I think it would be helpful for her to see how it is that she's been shaped and formed by an ideology, right? Now, it's not in her best interest in any way, shape, or form that actually denies the reality of her femininity, that seeks to dismantle who she is as a woman and hold up for her an ideal that is 
more masculinized in worldview, right. right? So go on out to EWTNRC.com, Rosemary, buy her this, wrap it up as a gift, tell her you really love her, so you wanted her to read this, subvert it, how I helped the sexual revolution hijack the women's movement. That's EWTNRC.com. I think that's the best thing you can do. And then you read it too. You get a copy for yourself and engage your own conversation. You lived this. That's right. You watched it happen. You can really help her. That's right. You can talk about it. Once she understands it, talk about it. That's tell, right. her, tell her about how it was then. If you're a grandmother, tell her how it was then and show her where it went wrong. That's said, right. Because it went wrong behind the scenes. We didn't see it. but it was, And then, of course, you know, this broke relationships. Explain to her that if she doesn't, if she just goes after the career and the ambition, where's the love? Yes. This was a power feminism that developed that night and not a love and relationship feminism. And what has feminism done to women? It's broken relationships. Mm -hmm. There's no, there, there, it's broken men from women. It's broken children from mothers. It's broken everything. And, and we need to, to get rid of that, femi that uh, sexual revolution, that right number eight in the uh, Women's Movement's uh, Bill of Rights. And what is that? That was Number abortion. Eight. That was the abortion. That was, that was the one that they fought over that night. That was the one they were fierce. One third of those feminists walked out of that, n that night and later resigned from now over the abortion vote. Mm -hmm. So the pro-life family feminist movement began again that very night. It had started with the suffragists. They were all pro-life. These, these one-third of women who walked out over the abortion vote were pro-life. One of them called a, a child, a, a baby in the womb, a sacred trust. Hmm. She was one of the founders mm -hmm. of now. And they walked out. So these pro-life family feminism is here today. And where do we see it all the time? At the March for Life. Well, there you go. And I want to tell you something. You know, I think it's very important for us to talk about journalism and what's happened to journalism, right? Yeah. And I think it's important for us to take a look at the fact that, and this is what we need to understand, we've been manipulated. That's right. Do you understand? I mean, people have been toying with your psyche, That's right. and there's no question about it. And it's and it's not it, it's not by a happenstance. It's by plan, because you've got these architects who are working very hard for a whole different worldview that is very far from the revealed truth of sacred scripture, the teachings of the church and have nothing to do with your real happiness. That's right. That's and we right. want you to call us right here. 800-221-9 Six zero. That's 800-221-9460 if you're in North America. Outside of North America, country code 1-205-271-2980. Our guest today is Sue Ellen Browder. She's author of Subverted, How I Helped the Sexual Revolution Hijack the Women's Movement, available for you at EWTNRC.com. We'll be right back. Stay with us. The wisdom of Mother Angelica. So many feminists who want to be equal, absolutely degrading themselves. That you want to be a priest, you want to be this, you want to be that, you want to be equal. And yet the media degrades your nature, your beauty as a woman, your, your goodness. What are you doing to your soul? Huh? What are you doing? Do you know what you're doing? You're taking a beautiful body, a beautiful soul, and you're degrading it into the dust. Let us pray. At some point, our dear Lord touches their hearts. Colin Donovan. Entering university, I had the religious understanding of someone catechized in the 1960s. That changed when a fellow freshman asked me if a Catholic could use the pill. My uninformed answer was, sure, why not? I then went and read Pope Paul VI encyclical Humanae Vitae and concluded, this is truth. I've never looked back in my love of our Catholic faith since. Open Line with Colin Donovan, Friday, 3 p.m. Eastern on EWTN Radio. 
This is Janet Benkovic, host of Women of Grace. Hello, this is Cardinal Donald Wuerl of the Archdiocese of Washington. This is Gloria Purvis, host of Morning Glory. Thanks for listening to the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Welcome back, friends. We're visiting with our guest, Sue Ellen Browder. As you can tell, we're chit-chatting through the breaks because this topic is so fascinating and so deep. And that's why I want you to get a copy of her book. I, you know, it's really quite an amazing book. I, I thoroughly, thoroughly recommend it. It is Subverted, How I Helped the Sexual Revolution Hijack the Women's Movement. It, you know, it's a title that's very dear to women of grace because we're all about authentic femininity. We're about being women in the eyes of God and living that reality out in our daily lives, which will always bring us happiness and other people happiness as well. So we want you to get out to womenofgrace.com. Uh, uh, we want you to visit our website and I want you to go to EWTNRC.com and purchase a copy of Sue Ellen's book. Our patron saint, as you know, is Dorothy Day. And I got to tell you, before we get back to our discussion, we have Nancy with us and she's from Wisconsin. Okay. So let's hear what she has to say. Hi, Nancy. How are you, sweetheart? I'm, I'm well. How are you, Jeanette? I'm very, very well. Thank you for asking. So what's going on in Nancy's world? Well, I'm just sitting here watching a little girl today, but I was interested in the show because I've thought often about, um, I have grown daughters who are watching the show, Sex and the City, mm. and I thought I should watch it to see what, you know, what they were, what they were seeing. And I found it interesting that in the end, um, of the four girls that they were highlighting, three of them um, wanted and ended up with conventional marriage and children, and they they went away from the free sex and the sex like men um, attitude that they were selling at the beginning of the show. Only one stayed in it. Seemed like she wanted to stay in it, but the other three. Um, one the powerful lawyer married a man who was a bartender and had a child and even took in her mother in law who um, and kind of mothered her mother in law who was suffering from alzheimer 's and the other one married and adopted children mm -hmm. and had her own children and even the star of the show married the man that she had been having an affair with. So yeah. I thought that the show kind of turned around, actually, and, and gave the um, audience um, a conventional marriage and what women really want. How do you interpret that, um, that well, I, ending of that very you know, well-watched television series? Right. Well, I think that women are, are, are smart. They they can they there is a lot of propaganda out there, but they but they get it after a while. We want relationships. Yes, uh, we're we're longing for relationships, and if we find them, uh, we take them. Yes, and and so and I think the tide is turning. I think that you're seeing a lot of young women today, and here's the that that are opting for relationships as opposed to completely just work, work, the work, work, culture. work, the, the hookup culture, and then, like, I'm going to get my satisfaction completely from work. Well, now, that was what Betty Friedan said. She said, work, a creative work of your own will set you free. Helen Gurley Brown said, work and sex without the kids will set you free. And in fact, what really sets you free is a, is a relationship with Christ, because Christ is the truth, right. the way and the life. So if, how do you get out of this propaganda? Cling closely to the truth in person, and you will not be deceived. Yes. And that's what's happening to a lot of young women today, is they are clinging to God, yeah. and when they do, they get it right. Well, you know, and, and that the fact is we, we want that relationship to be intact so that they don't have to go through all of the horror that is part of what this message will direct them toward. And I, right. I want to tell you one thing. I, I agree. I think that there is a tide that's swinging back, but there's a myth in what that show ended up showing. And the myth that that show ended up showing was that you can do all of these things and then suddenly you live happily ever oh, after. Oh, there you go. And you don't live happily ever after, after you've live that lifestyle. There's a ton of healing that has to take place. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, uh, decisions were made during that time period that cannot be taken back. 
you know, that can, wow. and so as a result of that, uh, oftentimes what will happen is that these lingering issues will disturb relationships as you move forward in time. So yeah, I'm, I'm happy that the, the script writers put them there, but there was a message in that too. See, you can do all of these things, oh, and yeah. in the end, you get you get the prize. Yeah. See, and, I didn't see that show. <laughs> yeah. I, well, yeah, I didn't watch the yeah, show either. Right, but but right, uh, you that's know, I'm interpreting right. the right. message, you know, from, from right. what we hear there. Let's go to Ruth. She also is calling us today from Wisconsin. How are you, Ruth? Hi, I'm, I'm fine. Well, I, good, honey. What's going on with you today? Well, um, I have a question about, um, I have a grandson that's engaged, but um, his girlfriend is pregnant, and I, as a grandmother, would like some suggestions on how to, to uh, treat the situation. Well, I'm, I'm going to give you my opinion, and then I'm going to let Sue Ellen address it. First of all, you know, the fact that this little child was conceived um, is really a grace from God in that every life is chosen by God to exist, right? So this little baby has been chosen by God to have life. Now, that doesn't mean that God condones the way in which the child was conceived. He doesn't condone the sin of it. But that sin is not the child's sin. And so we welcome this little baby into the world with open arms and, and with delight and with joy and with love, all right? And then, in a sense, we congratulate this young couple in the fact that they made a good decision. What we want for them to do, however, is to experience the grace of the sacrament of reconciliation and to take care of the sin that caused the child to be conceived, right? So uh, we live in a day and time where the option for abortion is so great. Right. We, we certainly are happy when a, a, a woman who finds herself with child out of wedlock gives birth to that child. Right. So, you know, you as a grandma, I think that you can explain that to them. I think that you can sit and you can tell them, you know, God loves this baby and I love you, but it's important to get your life straight with the Lord. And it's important to get married as soon as you can for the sake of this child. So oftentimes what I hear happening is that the couples want to postpone the wedding until after the baby's born because the, the, yes. the, well, because the girl who's going to be the bride wants to wear a beautiful dress and have a party. You know, and the idea is, no, 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 your decision has forced you to look more carefully, right. you know, at where right. you are. So exactly. do you have anything to add? Exactly. No, I think that the, what you've said there is absolutely right. Um, if they're not married, uh, everything is going to get more and more and more complicated. It is. And, and marriage is not always easy. But it is easy, but it is much easier than raising a child by yourself. <laughs> That's very true. We have just a couple minutes left, and okay. I want to ask you a question okay. uh, because I kind of suggested that we would talk about this, and that has to do with the fact that we think fake news is new. But That's what your story shows us is fake news is not new. <laughs> it's been around a long time. Half truth, selected truth, and truth out of context. Well, I, in some ways, I feel like newspapers lend themselves to fake news, okay? Because you can only set, say so much. Mm -hmm. So that, by its very nature, is, is a newspaper. Yes. That's so, so how do you, you know, they're going to have the March for Life um, where women pro-life feminists are going to be marching, are we going to see that on television everywhere? No. Probably not, right? Exactly. Because it has been unselected. And and one thing that you have to look for is things that are missing. What's missing in this piece? Mm -hmm. Well, that's very good advice, Sue yeah. Ellen Browder. Yeah. And it's been very good having you here. Okay. And I'm abundantly delighted. And I'm sorry that we couldn't get to the rest of all of our callers today. We thank you for watching. Here is the good news. Sue Ellen is staying with me through the day. We're going to do three more programs. You're going to get a chance to see this program again and the question and answer period as well, plus three additional shows. So we're going to be letting you know when those are going to be coming out so that you can tune in. If this topic is of interest to you, of course you want to get a copy of Sue Ellen's book. And you can do that by going out to EWTNRC.com. It is subverted how I helped the sexual revolution hijack the women's movement. It is, again, a fascinating read. Reads like a novel, chock full of facts. Craftsmanship in this book as an author wow. is exquisite. We do thank you for being with us today. Until we're together again, may the abundant life of Jesus Christ be yours, and may God richly bless you. Bye-bye.